still live and we are virtual folks from all over all over the country and maybe all over the world correct you may know that Lindner center of hope is celebrating our 15th anniversary so happy anniversary <laughs> i think it's amazing and we're so grateful for all of you who have been part of our journey providing assessments and treatment to individuals locally regionally nationally and even beyond we value our treatment partners and referrers and many of them are tuning in this evening so thank you very much tonight's presentation is coping with post-traumatic stress a journey toward healing and hope tonight's presentation is being presented by Dr. Megan Trunce. She is one of the nicest people I know. And um, her husband is here tonight. Can we verify? I agree. Right completely. I agree completely. Yes. That's wonderful. And, uh, I, 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 I'm a good assessor. And um, it has been a pleasure to work with you for all these years. And so grateful you are here tonight. I'm looking forward to listening um, with all I have. And it now gives me great pleasure to present to you this evening's presenter. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to be using this microphone, and sometimes I will take it out and walk around. I'm kind of a mover. Um, and sometimes I will be sitting here, so bear with me with that. Welcome to um, my presentation tonight, Linda's presentation. It's nice to see everyone. I think there's like a zillion people online, too, maybe who are joining us. Um, yeah. So, um, Tonight, I'm going to be talking about um, post-traumatic stress, as well as um, ways to begin a healing journey from that. So the first part, I'm going to talk about what post-traumatic stress is and kind of how it gets stuck in our brains and in our bodies. And then we'll talk a little bit about things that you can do kind of on your own and also when to seek professional help when that might be helpful. Um, so, and I welcome any kind of uh, questions throughout the, the evening. We don't have to wait till the end. You can raise your hand. Anybody online could do that as well. We have our moderator to help us out with that. So, okay, so let's go. It's a very cheerful topic, right? Okay, okay. Okay, so tonight um, I'm gonna talk about what post-traumatic post-traumatic stress disorder is and trauma. And this also goes for not just technically PTSD, but also any kind of adverse experiences that someone might go through. Um, talk about um, how this impacts people throughout the lifespan. So there's a lot of adults who kind of, they have some adverse experiences when they're growing up and it continues to impact them as, you know, kind of as they move through life. And so it's really important to touch on um, how trauma impacts children as they grow with their development. We'll talk a little bit about understanding what a traumatized brain does that can be a little different from a person who hasn't been through those things and discover opportunities for healing. Okay, so we think about what is trauma. So this is kind of a word that people sort of use a lot, like, oh, this was traumatizing and all that kind of stuff. When we think about um, the kind of trauma that really impacts a person, it is when someone really feels like they have been threatened or actually hurt, um, or they have witnessed something bad happening to somebody else. So some of them are, are really obvious, like um, physical abuse, sexual assault, um, growing up with um, domestic violence in the home and things like that. Um, right now we have things like school violence is very, um, th that's become very much a thing that, that we have had to deal with. Um, so think about school violence, um, accidents. Sometimes um, there's other things that people go through that we don't even think about like natural disasters, like tornadoes, hurricanes, storms. Um, people who have been involved in war-torn countries veterans. Um, so it's a sense of really feeling like your life has changed based on not feeling as safe, not feeling like you have as much control, and also feeling um, kind of like damaged by what happened to you, even though you move on. 
Anytime anybody has a question, just raise your hand. So trauma does not have to be these things. Trauma can also be kind of insidious and chronic. Think about um, like growing up in an area that just has danger all around, um, where there might be crime around or just um, insecurity in the home, um, poverty, um, not stable parents, things like that. So sometimes it doesn't, you don't have to say, well, this one thing happened to me. Trauma can also mean ongoing experiences that a person has that change how they see themselves in the world. Okay, so post-traumatic post stress disorder is actually, it's, it's a pretty high level of trauma, but for anybody who comes to this, like I, I just wanna explain that it doesn't have to be this severe to actually suffer from having um, trauma in your life. But when you think about post-traumatic stress, um, think about um, recurrent involuntary memories. So kind of like intrusive memories, intrusive thoughts, sometimes to the point where they're like flashbacks, which is like feeling like you're there, like it's happening again. Um, trying to avoid things that remind you of what happened. So this could be not going to certain places, avoiding certain occasions, people, um, sometimes not going to sleep or trying to do something to take away um, the memory. Um, adverse experiences can really change how we see ourselves and the world. So um, we might have negative self-beliefs, such as um, feeling responsible or feeling hurt, like, like you're um, never going to get better, having guilt, having shame, um, not being able to trust people. Those are examples of maybe how your view of yourself and others has changed. So that really impacts how a person um, just interacts with the whole world. Um, does anybody here um, like work in a school or work with kids or just like, okay, okay. Um, so feel free to jump in um, at, any, at any time. Um, um, can especially, um, like you can see this very much in children uh, with their difficulty um, trusting adult, other adults and things like that. But that can even be us as adults. Yeah, not being able to trust. Um, things that seem like they should be normal sometimes seems like they're threatening. Yeah, just kind of like you, you view the world in a, through a different lens. And also it shows up in your body. So it impacts in your body in a way that you feel kind of on edge in some way. Uh, hypervigilant, kind of like kind of like checking your back is what it can do to you. And sometimes it can lodge in your body in a way that just feels like pain or tightness or some kind of suffering. Um, that that's very common. And it can show up with inner mood, like with irritability and things like that. Sometimes people who have suffered adverse experiences do some kind of wacky things. They might do some reckless things um, because they are just kind of on edge all the time and they are seeking some way to change that or feel better. Okay, so we think about can't get it out of your head, can't get it out of your body, and seeing the world as a different place and maybe even seeing yourself as a different person that's changed because of what happened. Okay, so what does post-traumatic stress look like just kind of in general? And this, this slide, I thought it was really cool when I was making it, and then, you know, we get here and it's like, well, that's hard to see, but that's a, <laughs> um, so fear is, is common. So fear um, in, for things that shouldn't even be scary, that shows up. Depression is very common. Feelings of anger, and anger at things that don't seem like something a person would be angry about. Avoidance of things. Um, for example, um, like I said, avoiding people. Um, sometimes people avoid their own emotions by doing things like using substances 
or in, engaging in behaviors that kind of take their mind off what they're going through, that's all part of avoidance. Um, and just in general, difficulty dealing with, with stressful things because your body and your mind are already under so much stress that other thing, like it, it's really hard to have the capacity to deal with just life stressors. Um, any, any comments or questions so far? You can think about um, um, just, I don't know, your own experiences, people that you know, anything like that. Um, I have a feeling the first person who talks will break the ice. So I have a question <laughs> then. <laughs> so I can hear for yourself. Yeah. My niece um, is going through some anxiety right now, mm -hmm. and she keeps saying that she feels something in her shoulder, but she just had a baby a year ago. She's lugging the carrier around everywhere, and she's very tiny. She has five children, mm -hmm. and so she's picking this baby up on that same side that you're saying hurt you, and she's lugging this one-year-old around on that same side, and I'm explaining to her that these are things happening to your body because you're older. You're paying more attention to the feelings of that muscle strain of lifting and pulling. I'm trying to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. But I want to know if there really is something going on psychologically that make her feel those things. Uh, that she's holding yeah. that in her body, that it's it's kind of stuck there. Yeah. Can you repeat the question as it was so they can hear? Uh, so, one, so one person said that she's here for herself. That was a great thing to say. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, you're, Sharon. Sharon. And Anne. Anne, okay. So Sharon said... Um, that her niece has had five kids and she is kind of lugging around one of them in the car seat all the time. And, but she has this pain already in her shoulder and it gets worse carrying the baby around, but, but Sharon wonders if she actually is going through something or has been through something that's holding that pain inside of her. So, and that's wonderful that you're here mm -hmm. to try to learn a little bit more and to help her. That's what teachers do. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay. So, um, so sometimes people show things. They show emotions and behaviors, and you think, what is up with them? And it can be post-traumatic stress kind of things in disguise. So kids who act up might be doing it because they're, they've been going through stuff. Um, if there's a lot of anger or someone's very sad or very anxious, uh, sometimes when you do a little digging, there could be something going on. Not every, not all the time, but sometimes there can be. Post-traumatic stress can um, basically make everything worse and is also linked to a bunch of other uh, mental health conditions. Um, anxiety, sometimes it gets in the way of getting better from that or depression or OCD and things like that. Question? Yes. I have a question. Uh, okay, so my son is bipolar. And with him going through the different medicines and things like this, and having you for the medicine, um, and back for him for the lifetime. So does PTSD come into effect with that also? It depends on what he's been through. Sometimes having a mental illness like that can have um, just that in itself can be um, a really difficult experience for a person. Um, particularly um, with bipolar disorder, if, if he's gotten into situations that are like secondary situations that are really difficult, like um, he's been hurt some way physically or um, or emotionally hurt in a way, like things that might happen because he acts out in a way with depression or manic yeah, behaviors. Like, like with him, I'm trying to hold on to a job. He can only really hold on to it for a short time. And then he just sinks, you yeah. know? And then we have to try and encourage him, you know, bring him back, bring him back, like, take him over to the lender center, try and uh, get him back on course again. Then, so, I don't know, I don't know what you're are you wondering if, if maybe post-traumatic stress could be mixed in? So the question was, 
Um, can someone um, who has a serious uh, mental illness also have post-traumatic stress mixed in? So he may not necessarily have post-traumatic stress, um, that, but it's possible that that could be, he might have gone through some things that also impact him um, and in the way he sees himself and the world in addition to the depression that he suffers and um, what happens when he might have a manic episode, for sure. Yeah. And the other part of the question might be, when someone is going through a mental illness and treatment, can that cause extra stress that look like? Can that look like post-traumatic stress? I think so, I think so. So, some, so it's kind of both, it's like sometimes, um, Maybe not your son with who has a bipolar diagnosis, but sometimes people have depression and there's post-traumatic stress disorder that is feeding that. And sometimes it's just depression or bipolar disorder. Um, and it's just that. Um, but what I, but I think what I was trying to communicate, tell me if I'm answering your question, um, um, that the experiences somebody has when they have a major mental illness can can get people in situations that uh, hurt them in some way and can cause more difficulties. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to clarify now uh, because it's been bipolar, 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 and we we tried to focus around. And now, should I be looking at a different avenue for PTSD? That would be something that that would be good to. If you are on kind of like his team, so to speak, like you have ability to talk to his providers, like that, that that would be something to ask them, and they would be in the best position to try to um, sift through those things. Yeah, Sharon. In teaching special ed, um, we do like behavior modifications and observations, and we have to be able to identify some of the behaviors that are happening in the classroom. And you go from one spectrum to the next, but the way you're able to um, to um, identify when each person is spending time with them separate from a group of people to make that diagnosis valid as well. And, uh, extra help is needed. We can provide it at uh, the school level because you're actually by involved in the school. And with the traumas that we're having with gun violence, and we see a lot of that. Uh, traumatic stress, mm -hmm. and some kids that are have bipolar disorder or they have social disorders uh, tend to be more on edge in the school setting. So, when would it be okay to send them to a, a place like the Learning Center or uh, Children's Hospital? Because a lot of my kids are under age. Go for the lenders. lenders. So that is a good question, uh, and I'm going to address it, that at the end, but I might as well address it now. Um, when it seems like, um, like in your situation with the kids, when the behavior is to the point where um, they can't learn, um, they're disrupting their own stuff and other kids, it would be a great idea to have an assessment just to, to sort out what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that could hurt. And I think, oh, me? Yeah. I was just trying to help him in that, um, the PTSD, I mean, if you, Sometimes you're labeled bipolar and it seems like um, they're just medicated, 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 but is somebody really reaching, like really a team diving deep with like your whole past? And then like, um, I've had, my PTSD is not, and it, it did, it has now through the years, it has called the depression, the anger, but it was, not determined um, until I had brain scans done. And that helped immensely because there was something that happened to me at 10 years old. And until those brain scans were done and showed the emotional trauma all through life, um, it was- You didn't know, yeah. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. so it, it did, there was nothing ever that I ever talked through um, as far as the incident when I was 10, never talked, never did counseling, never did because I just was doing okay in the 70s by my parents. But until somebody, um, a um, internist doctor and his therapist 
did brain scans and it showed um, why I could have had these two really bad bouts with depression and landed in Lindner Center. It all is now being labeled PTSD due to emotional trauma throughout okay. her. Okay. So PTSD could be causing, you know, I don't know what his son's back, if, if anything ever happened to him that you don't know about. I mean, so, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. So, um, so yeah, so for, for the online listeners and the participants, um, um, someone, and I didn't catch your name, Susie, Susie <laughs> shared that, um, that she went through a lot um, of her own mental health struggles and then discovered later that she well, had had some later, things that have happened. Way later in life. Yeah, so. yeah. And figured that out later in life. Right. Um, okay. I'm going to tell you guys real quick about this study that was done, um, kind of like starting in the 90s, but it went on for several years. It was something called the ACE study, and ACE means Adverse Childhood Experiences. It was um, done by um, at Kaiser Permanente Hospital in California, and they discovered. They gave, they gave everybody, the adults that came in just for like a physical, they gave them a questionnaire, said, you know, like, did any of these things happen to you when you were a kid? And I'm going to go over that in a second. And um, then they correlated um, adverse childhood experiences with physical health things that people were showing up with at the doctor. And the more kind of like stuff that happened to them as they were kids, more likely there would be physical health problems. So this is kind of like that mind-body connection. Um, so the ACEs were things like, these were the questions that they asked people about, like if they had emotional, physical, or sexual abuse as a child, um, if their mother was treated violently, if there was substance abuse in the home, or anybody in the house went to jail, got involved with legal stuff maybe, um, if there was a mentally ill parent, um, or if there was neglect in the home, emotional neglect or physical neglect in the home. And so um, the more the adults um, endorse these things and the more physical stuff they actually suffered from um, is correlated. Um, okay, here's some of the things that happen um, to kids when they're growing up and they have trauma, like what actually happens during their development. Have you guys heard of this idea that trauma actually impacts how brains develop and things like that? Okay, and they're even talking about um, that traumatic experiences can even impact the development of, of a fetus as well, okay, which is kind of like mind blowing if you think about it. Um, so these are the things, these are the areas that get impacted. So we think about like when, you know, babyhood through growing up, there are different areas that are necessary to really like grow up well. And they have to do with attachment, you know, to stable adult figures. Um, there's the biology, there's the brain growth. And at some point along the way, in the different stages, child learns how to kind of like emotionally regulate themselves. Think about like a baby doesn't really do this very well. They can rely on their adults to take care of them. But as you grow up, you kind of learn how to do this on your own. But trauma can impact all of these things. So if you're a baby and, or a toddler and you're um, in a situation where you're not being taken care of, you might not develop a secure attachment that can, um, that can result in having just difficulty holding boundaries as an adult, having healthy relationships. Um, sometimes um, in families, like trauma gets passed down, just not just in biology, but in behaviors as well. Um, the brain has a different kind of stress response. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, that hyperarousal can sort of like look like ADHD, kind of like just bouncing all over the place. Um, and there really is a change in how the, how the brain can develop if a, if a child is under constant stress. Doesn't mean that they can't get better because they can't get better. The brain is always developing and growing even when you're older. Um, so kids who have developed, who have been impacted by trauma tend to have higher rates of depression and things like being angry and irritable, 
getting into trouble sometimes like it just kind of snowballs into all the other stuff like um substance abuse and acting out and things like that which sounds like a terrible this sounds like a this sounds awful doesn't it um so but these are just some these are just some of the areas that can be um, impacted by by trauma when you're growing up so if you think about okay that happens to a child they're definitely going to take some of this along with them as they grow even as adults so as adults they learn new things about adulting but some of these things could still be there um, um, so i work with both kids and adults and i see um you know adults who have had trauma in their childhood they do struggle they do at least the ones that come to see me which i know is a limited sample size because they're coming to see me but um they do tend to struggle with having healthy relationships like they really it's really hard for them to figure that out because they just didn't see that growing up um, they might be more reactive um, physically they're kind of like in that hyper vigilant state so um any questions about this part yeah, I was just as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking um, my father got really sick when I was 13 and died seven weeks later. I literally don't remember about three years of school. Like I kind of remember some friends here and there, but if you think my teachers were, what my classes were, anything. So is that really common? But I had had many people in my family die before that, and I went to every single funeral from the time I was like five. So I have recurring memories of seeing them laying in caskets i mean i still see wow. all of that all you know 40 years later but the the thing i just remember the amnesia that's what really bothers me is not being able to remember a lot of my junior high high school years I know that. okay so so for um online participants um uh, the comment was made about uh like a, a traumatic grief loss of a parent and then um and other deaths and then about like having amnesia about just life in general, like actually losing three years, like who was my teacher, what did I do? And um, that is common and, um, and it's kind of like your brain taking care of you in a way um, at the time, but that can be very um, aggravating as an adult to try to look back and figure things out and to like really have no idea what was happening. So it sounds like you, you were just trying to get, you just kept on going as best you could. Yeah, yeah. Ah, more domains, like developmental domains. So we also have behavior, cognition, and self-concept. So being confident in your own self, knowing who you are, being unconditionally loved, um, those things are really important in all aspects of our life um, very much. Sometimes people walk around just with this inherent sense of guilt and shame, and maybe they can't even put their finger on it, but it's there, and that can change their whole life as to how they, what they feel like they deserve and what they can achieve in their lives and who they're going to um, make relationships with and things like that. Okay, the thing about cognition and attention, there's even some studies that show that um, kids in, are in a very traumatized environment, their, um, their intellectual development will not be the same as well as kids who are not. Um, again, um, these things can change. All Trauma can really be treated very much and the brain is always developing, always growing. Any questions about this? these items, okay. We will get to the more fun part at some point. Okay, so again, effects of like these adverse childhood experiences on adults. So they tend to have more heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and some of the health problems they have are like these domino effects from health behaviors that aren't healthy, like um, substance use, alcohol use, recklessness that might involve having babies when you're not ready to have babies, hooking up with people that you really shouldn't be with and getting stuck in those relationships. And that keeps the domino effect going on. And um, that can impact a lot of things like 
um, finances and other other behaviors in life that could bring a person um, worse health or make them at risk for worse health. Okay, so your physical health, your mental health, and your just general quality of life can be impacted. Um, in this study, those things were impacted um, by adults who had more trauma as kids. Doesn't mean it's gonna happen, for sure. I met lots of adults who are so incredibly high functioning that you can't believe it. And then they come in and you're like, what happened to you? And you are this, 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 and like, whoa, like all good. Um, doesn't mean that, you know, everything's gonna go downhill. There's People can be very resilient. Kids can be very resilient. Um, but for those people who who come to see me, it doesn't change. It doesn't change. They're still hurting, even though they're able to really function well. Okay. okay so trauma can be acute or chronic or both. Um, any idea, other ideas of like what a chronic trauma could be, either as an adult or a child? I kind of threw out a couple earlier, like, um, like I, I used to work at um, Hillcrest Training School, which doesn't really exist now, but it was a place where, where kids who were um, adjudicated went for treatment. And I mean, a lot of those kids just had trauma. I mean, they were growing up in areas that weren't safe. Um, and that was always there. And they wouldn't spend, like, if you'd ask them about that, they'd be like, oh, well, you know, that's just the thing. That's just life, right? But it really impacted how they were growing up, how they felt about themselves, their um, their behaviors, a lot of things. So that would be like an example of chronic. Um, when you're a child um, and have been in a car accident or hit by a car and a teenage, and then, you have recurring nightmares about being in a car accident, which I'm back to my niece again. Could that be something as a trigger for her in her adult life? That could it be could be. That sounds like an acute acute event that happened, like yeah. getting in a car. So that would be an example of it, an acute event. Yeah. She got in a car accident at, at age two, and then it, it kind of comes back, or she has dreams, and she remembers it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Just to complete the circle, <laughs> Jim is it? Gentleman in the blue shirt. Me. So no, the gentleman. In, I I think that you know when you were describing your son who suffers from bipolar disorder, I I was thinking of chronic trauma that it's very challenging for people who are young adults living with a major mental illness to see their siblings or their high school peers, et cetera, having greater levels of independence, greater levels of income, greater levels of educational and, and occupational success. And, and I think that can be very difficult, very challenging in a traumatic sort of way. The, you know, the, the idea that it can be a chronic um, chronic event for them. You know, one thing it has done is it has affected the dark pain. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh. Because it's siblings or it's friends, whatever. It's including it's, yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's a, okay. Yeah. So uh, it's how it, it's, it's the continual battle to um, keep ourselves healthy because when this happens, we all sink. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah. So, so I want to raise my hand too because exactly, Jim, is that right? To death. And that's exactly what we are facing as a family right now. And I had some trauma earlier as well, but our whole our whole family is now. Jill and I are married, and, and what you said is that's why I want to interject because that's exactly the thing. What do you do? But it impacts everyone. You don't really know what to do. You're just in this fire, right? You're just kind of stuck. And it's hard to get out of that every time it happens, whatever episode it is. Mm -hmm. so, as for us, we're, we're going through a, a he's 34 years old. I can't hear and we're going through this right now. Want to walk through. Um, it's as high as it was. Um, so, what we're going 
is reaching out uh, for therapy and, and things like that for ourselves, you know, um, which helps a lot. Um, but still, even with that, um, and, and I can only say it feels like a death. You know, we've all experienced that in our lives. And it's just like, when is this person going to come back to life again? Yes. It, it's a death, but it's also uh, Groundhog Day death. Uh, no. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. Just <laughs> thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, no, that's good. good. That's good. Okay. So um, for our online people, we're just talking about um, uh, kind of like a chronic uh, sense of grief and loss that comes from having somebody in the family with a major mental illness. It just impacts everyone. In the family, that's um, just chronically hurtful. Yeah. I could also add that we 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 went through some classes with NAMI, et cetera, and, and all of our counselors. You know, 15 years ago, they said get ready because it might impact one of your other. We have three daughters, and now we're we're right there again. So wow, that's another. <laughs> So kind of like uh, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah, the other shoe drops with the first, but then now the shoe is dropping several times with the, the others. It's, uh, it's really something. This is a, a, a like a, a an example of like how even if it's not yourself in particular, if it's happening to somebody you love and impacts it's your family how difficult it can be, which is its own trauma. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the one I think one of the one of the toughest things, uh, my wife and I have been married 42 years, 43 years. And it's that it's that highs and highs and lows that we go through uh, in the isolation. Where we just completely shut down from each other, and and we're constantly trying to find that how how to reconnect. Because sometimes it's better just to be by yourself, but then that's not good either. Um, like I say, the good, when it's the good times, you, you know everything's going along, he's working, things like that. But when all heck breaks loose. I mean, you really, you really suffer that, and I mean, I know the thing you go to work and stay together, but it's that isolation part that really hurts. So connection helps um, manage these kinds of situations. It, it's real, like it's important. It really, is important. Okay, I think I have another comment. Okay, I'm gonna do the microphone. Um, I also want to bring it similar to the mental. Um, I personally am battling cancer right now. And so seeing, um, just knowing how mentally I have changed overnight, the minute they told me if my cancer was back and that fear every single time I have had a scan, is it going to be worse? Is it going to be better? Is there an answer for it? But then to see how it affects the whole family here again, them not knowing, they're not in, in the room with me when they hear the doctor, you know, and, and all this. To, and so I have to come back and interpret, you know, and try to be positive, and even if it's not good sometimes. Um, but there's so much of the physical illness now, especially now, um, that people are going through that can you, from having a, a chronic physical illness, PTSD is like, because I remember just literally being in the pit immediately the minute they said it um so i didn't know if that was just something that yeah what was that for Katie? no i no, absolutely um having a chronic physical illness or or sounds like uh with cancer like it was there it was treated and then it came back so there's that oh no it's happening again like what's going to happen so that sense of fear fear the unknown and um one thing about post-traumatic stress that I'm going to get to is there's this um, there's this really raw sense of um, 
now feels just like then. Uh, and, and in your situation, it might be very similar. It sounds like it, it's a very similar situation. Um, but people who have been through really bad things um, sometimes get themselves in a situation where something may seem like, like, okay, I've been through this before. This is going to be just as bad as it was. Um, and again, your situation could be different, but, um, and it's really not. So like things that are not really threatening feel really, really threatening. And it's that uncertainty of not knowing how is this going to work out? Is this going to be like that? What can I do? I have to figure out a way to make it better. Um, I don't know what to do. Um, there's that that sense. That's really important. Um, okay, so acute and chronic. Sometimes people kind of forget about the chronic everyday things, but those are real. Okay. So what is going on that trauma can really do this? So this is kind of like, what can it do to a person's brain? So it, it what it ends up doing is it kind of deactivates the parts that you need and overactivates the parts that you don't really need. And your brain does this kind of like in this reaction to keep you safe or what it's thinking that you need to be safe. And when the time is actually going on, you, like the actual event, like you, you probably need these things, but when there's like a chronic trauma or maybe the trauma has passed and there might be some reminders of the trauma, but it's not really there, your brain's still pretending that it's there and it's responding in this way. And so this is real. This is the real, um, how it really impacts your body. So, so like this, prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's kind of like the, I don't know, like the computer rational part of your brain. Um, when you are emotionally flooded, that part doesn't really work as well. And we can all attest to this, right? Like in situations where we got carried away in some kind of an emotion, whether it's, you know, positive or negative, and we were like, didn't think something through. Um, so this happens in, a, in somebody's brain when they're experiencing post-traumatic stress. It's really hard to think rationally. So this impacts just everything. It impacts like how you interpret things in your life. It impacts maybe decisions you make. Uh, it's really hard. It's, I mean, it's real. Um, so there's a part of your brain that is um, that has to do with emotions is under activated. So they're just really hard to manage all the emotions. And then the part of your brain that's like the fear response, that goes up as well. So it's kind of like, this is the part that, um, like your amygdala, this is the part that like the on button is there even when it doesn't need to be. So it seems like stuff is just a threat all the time. So what is your body gonna do if you feel like you're in peril? Like what are some things that your body does? Feel tight. Danger. Oh, flight. flight. Fight or flight. Or Fight, flight, or freeze. Your body, your muscles feel tight. Cry. Might cry. Yeah. Um, your heart races. You might sweat. It's like all of these um, body responses that get a person out of danger are turned on. And those are very uncomfortable to have when there's uh, just on a day-to-day -day basis. Very uncomfortable to have those things. Okay, so in your brain, it impacts your thinking, makes it so you can't think as rationally, and it overactivates your fear, and it also makes it so that you're flooded with emotions, and that's really hard to manage. So that's what's going on in a person's brain. Any, uh, any questions about that or comments? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, if you're flooded with emotions, do you have difficulty naming what you're feeling? Yes. Okay. So the question is, if you're flooded with emotions, do you have difficulty naming what you're feeling? Absolutely. And then if you can't figure out what you're feeling, it's really hard to know what to do yeah. about that. And that is, um, that's very common. And also some, sometimes people actually never learn what the names for those feelings are. Yeah. 
because they didn't like when, when they were younger. Yeah, I, I would say my name is Jill. My husband introduced us. Um, this is a real aha moment because the rational side of a normally very intelligent person just goes zoop. And then, and I know I call it spiraling. And uh, the psychiatrist told us that when they were young, that you want to avoid that spiral because it's hard to get back up. But understanding how the brain has been affected over all these years really helps me understand the day-to-day -day functioning. And I would say the hard thing for me is that my parenting just had to change completely. And, and I just kind of lost track of boundary setting because it was always responding to the mental illness. So I have friends who just totally don't understand. And so now I feel like, okay, you all need to come to this class so you can understand this is a trauma, uh, uh, the effect of a trauma on the brain. So this child that looks young adult, that looks different on the outside, that looks normal on the outside, is, is dealing with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jill. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments about that? Questions? Yes. Talk about um, like different different um, types. What if what if um, a person just has no feelings at all? Or there's, uh, there's no fear. There's no like if somebody dies, you're like that's sad. Uh, okay. Okay. So that so the question was, what if it's like a person doesn't have any feelings, or they present like they don't have any feelings? Um, that sounds like avoidance. Yeah. And uh, because it's, and even for them, not just maybe avoiding you or whoever they're talking to, but themselves. Like if I actually feel this, I am not going to be able to handle it. And I will like, you know, self combine, like implode or something like that. Yeah. That sounds like avoidance. Yeah. Could it be that you've had enough, like with everything in life, like if one more thing happened in my life, that's it. So nothing else matters. There's a there's a the part of the brain. So, my, my, I this so the part of the brain that is that, that reminds you that it's okay stays on while you're going through these traumatic things around you. This is what I experienced in my classroom with my with my boys, they uh, have a severe behavior handicap. We have socially, emotionally disturbed children. We have kids with social disorders. They don't do well in uh, social groups. So what I learned to do is individualize each personality like Jim. You have to change that teacher perception and become what that, baby, what that child needs in that moment. So in order to do this to keep your sanity, you have to go into an avoided stage where nothing else going on in the, in the classroom matter. I'm focusing on this individual person, and it tends to move everybody else along uh, properly. So if you focus on the problem that will be problematic, that will cause the confusion in the classroom, and get that under control, then people tend to fall in sync. Same way with the sibling effect. The older child did, did had this behavior. The two other siblings have watched this behavior uh, not being, uh, you know, responded to in a manner that, oh, I could deal with that if she doesn't be like that. So then a lot of it is brought on as a, like a latch on in households. Um, I've watched that too. And then if you did separate them, even in the household and do things individually, it can break the cycle. Uh, and you get to know that individual person, which is what his mother is trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Being in our home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you also describe um, working with these kids. You have to kind of, uh, it sounds like you're not necessarily avoiding all of the, I mean, like you have to compartmentalize for yourself to be able to work with them. Like, Put, put the other stuff in like a container and say, okay, I'm going to work with this this person right now. Is that kind of what you're what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, because otherwise you would be flooded yes. with everything. And then when, yeah. you go, when you go away and avoid it, 
happens when you get in your car, you bump your gospel music and you work behind you and you get home and you this whole other person, like rose colored glasses person and my nieces and sisters and brothers say, she's weird, <laughs> but you almost have to be. You almost have to be. The you have to feel like you have to do that. Grounded. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be a healthy way of like uh, putting that away for the night. Like, okay, when I go home, I'm going to be rose colored glasses. Um, but the other situation of like, I don't have any feelings about this. That seems more like actual, um, I'm avoiding what I'm feeling. Like I'm done. I can't do this. I'm just going to cut it off. Yeah. Which probably works for a little bit, but it's not going to work forever. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, so kind of like general themes of trauma. So there's three themes that we tend to see, and they have to do with responsibility, safety, and control. So generally, if something bad has happened to a person or an ongoing thing, um, sometimes a person can feel all these things. Sometimes they might just identify with a couple of them or one of them. So responsibility has to do with, okay, whatever it was that happened, that's my fault. And or, and or, I am like irreparably damaged. And people are really good at responsibility because what, if, if you kind of feel like it's something you could have prevented or stopped, then there's like this thing that happens in your brain where you go back and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to pretend I can go back to that now and I can change it because then I have some control. Then I can, man, then I can make it so it didn't happen. Um, that's kind of what the brain is trying to do, but really what the person is left with is, okay, like I really should have known better or I really should have stopped it or I should, like, I should have, you know, I should have known, um, it, you know, I did something to cause this. And then the, the damaged part is like, I'm unlovable. I'm ugly. Nobody wants to be friends with me. Uh, like really deep stuff like that. Okay. So that can be one thing that people take away from having trauma is that inside. Um, safety is another one. So feeling like not just whatever happened was unsafe, but like everything's unsafe. Um, like I'm not gonna go back to the doctor because that was that was scary. Like I'm not going back there because all those doctors are just gonna tell me blah or they're gonna do blah. Like I'm not like that's not safe. Or um, you know, certain like whole classes of adults are not safe. Or I'm never going to another, you know, amusement park again because of what happened making on that one time and that was scary. Or something like that. So lots of things feel like more than what should be. It's like this feeling of safety and also feeling like you can't keep yourself safe. Like you just don't have those tools. And the third area that gets impacted is control. So a lot of times when bad things happen, there is a sense of like, you didn't have control over it. Like it just happened to you. So this sense of powerlessness and which feels terrible. And so how this might show up just later in life is just if you feel kind of helpless with something really bad that happened to you, you might start acting like that, not really on purpose, but it just kind of like feeling like that about like other things in your life, like not being able to, um, manage things, like maybe a person who didn't feel so out of control or helpless with bad things um, that happened to them. And not even really wanting to be that way, just that sometimes that will happen. So a sense of like, um, I was like this thing happened and I couldn't control it. Um, so that is an issue for me. When, so maybe it's over, maybe it shows up as over control. You know, like it shows up like I have to have things a certain way and if they don't, I'm gonna flip out because that's just something that makes me feel better because it's something that I went through. So um, so if you think about, um, uh, I don't know, people, your loved ones or yourself or anyone that you know, these are three areas that are opportunities really for 
for moving forward. Like if you can identify them in yourself, that it can be it can be seen as an opportunity. So let's talk more about healing. Healing um, from trauma. So I like this question. So a lot of times when something bad happens, people will say, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you doing this? Why are you acting like this? Why can't you get it together? Or, you know, whatever. The better question is what happened to you? And if you're curious, if you are a curious person and you are talking to someone, like that is the better thing to say, really is not to what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. It's really important because that, that helps with that responsibility aspect. People who have been through things already probably feel like something's wrong with them because something happened to them. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. I was, sure. big, I was special ed in school and I never could understand how I ended up in the special ed classroom. But the whole time it was circumstances in the home like not having food, not having uh, proper clothes to wear, don't want to go to school because you're bullying your people. So those those kind of behaviors kind of was like the teacher would say, read, I don't feel like reading, I'm starving, I'm trying to just get through the day so that lunch can come because you don't get to eat at home. And usually lunch is the only time that you get to eat at school. So I took all of the baggage of coming up in a special ed class and getting an understanding of policies that need to be changed. And by the 11th grade, I was uh, caught uh, changing policies and procedures and getting inclusion programs uh, involved because teaching us on the same level, I knew going in there that I was in college prep classes, but I was depreciating in the classroom being taught on the same level with kids with learning disabilities. So I'm saying all of this to say that had had united for fighting me to get involved on the school level so that I could go in and pinpoint behaviors based on whether the kid is bad at home or the situation is bad at home. Going to do home visits and then taking care of that kid in my classroom. So that isn't a problem. So if they come to school a little earlier, I do hair, put them on my perfume, set them down to the classroom, clean them up with Walmart uh, uniforms. And then when the other kids come in, they're not happy. Everybody smell good, everybody look good. So everybody can work. So they were in accelerated classes. You have to be victimized and then not allow it to hold you as a victim, but do something in its place to build you in a place to well, this won't happen in my on my watch. So I went how, back to where I was. How wonderful that that you you were you I mean you you really made an impact even in, when you were still in school, like in high school. That is remarkable. Um, but so what what you're saying that when you were a lot younger and you were in those special ed classes, people were like, okay, what's what is wrong with you? But it's really what was happening to you in your life. You didn't have those re like those basic resources and necessities that you needed to to really be yourself. So in school. As an adult, yeah. I became a resource agent so that all those programs that didn't work for my mom. I became a resource, a referral agent to make sure kids have beds, have food, have clothing, you know, in my adult life. So a lot of times being traumatized as a kid puts you in an arena where how can I help? You, you ever watch um, the new Amsterdam? How can I help? That's the new question is how can I help? And then you put yourself out there to be that help for the next person that's going through trauma or dealing with it in their home. It takes yeah. a special kind of teacher to do that kind of yeah special yeah thing. so like really making lemonade out of lemons like yes. what happened yes yeah in a very intentional meaningful way okay. that's helped others yes yeah. yeah. so so if you ask the question what happened to you isn't that going to make somebody feel guilty that they've got PTSD so how do you heal it's more, it's more like the, um, so the question is about like what happened to you could that kind of put somebody in the spot or make them feel worse. And so 
this is not a question for like casual conversation. It's it's more like a mindset. It really is a mindset. Like instead of thinking about a, a person like, what is wrong with you? It's more like, wow, something must have happened to this person. I wonder what that was. Like, I wonder what they've experienced or what they're dealing with. It really is more of a mindset. Um, um, I, I see what you're saying. If you act in a certain way, it could sound like an accusation, but it's really more about like having um, a curious mindset. Yeah, because I, yeah. I mean, if you go, what's wrong with you? What happened to you? That, like, yeah. I don't know what happened to people. I went through this uh, growing up in this bad situation or whatever, you know, and they feel guilty about that. Is that second? Well, but it's a mindset that we have to have. Yeah, it's more of your mind, it's more of a person's mindset. Concerned. So that's where the mindset mm -hmm. More of a mindset. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So people like like all the responses that we have when we've been through trauma, like people tend to feel bad about that. But really that's normal. The stuff that happened was the abnormal stuff, not the person who's going through it. And that's the other part that people get confused. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm doing all this stuff. I must be terrible. No, that's normal. What happened to you is not normal. Okay, so this is a, like a um, so that that mindset is an opportunity for self-compassion and for self-understanding and insight. Okay, hold on. Wow. Did I just accidentally turn this off? What happened to it? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? It's better. Oh, yeah. We're good. Okay. What happened to you? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so some more opportunities for healing. So one thing that can be, um, if you feel like you're going through it or something's going on, one thing that to be mindful of are just, okay, what are my trauma reminders or my triggers? Like what is pushing my butt? Um, so they, this word trigger is used a lot. I know, like this triggers me, that triggers me, blah, 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 triggers. So I like to actually use the word trauma reminder or those two words together. Um, and trauma reminders can crop up and they usually cause like a physical response in a person. Could be that tension, tightness, fast heartbeat, sick to your stomach, want to run away, um, frozen, something like that. Um, so just being aware of what those things are can be really helpful. Um, putting yourself where you know that you are going to be reminded of a trauma, unless you really have to go there as part of your daily life, it's not necessarily the best thing. You don't have to like um, expose yourself to that if you don't really need to. Like it's actually okay not to see a certain person if you don't have to, if they remind you. Um, some people think they have to do that to be, to get over it. Um, that's one way of thinking about it, but you don't really have to do that. Um, you might not be able to avoid those reminders because they might just be part of your life. And that's okay, but it's just good to know what they are. Um, can anybody think of like an example of this and just in general or something about where they might feel like, uh oh, a little bit because of something that happened. Don't have to share too much if you don't want. Just wondered if anybody was had that in their, in their brain. For myself, certain smells now will remind me of getting chemo. Mm -hmm. Okay, smells. Taste. Yeah, smells and taste. So things that are reminders. Don't just have to be like people, places, and things. They can be very sensory because the body remembers um, those things. Smells, tastes, um, things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So identify maybe what some of your reminders are and pay attention to that. And pay attention without judging it. Here's the thing. This is, can be tricky, is um, noticing that it's happening without having to figure it out 
like fully or to say it's bad or terrible or I'm this is doom and gloom, like not actually having to do anything about it, just paying attention. I'm remembering another training, and maybe you did this training, but the expression, so I was just maybe you told me this before. So when it happens, you say, Oh, I know what this is. Yeah. Just, I know. Instead of not knowing, you just, I know I don't do anything with it, but I know what this is. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. I can get through it. I know. Yeah. So. The way Tom is saying, the way Tom was saying that was like, okay, I know. Like he wasn't saying that it was, he wasn't really labeling it as um, anything good, bad, or otherwise. He was just saying, okay, I, I, this is what that is. Um, okay. Is that like being there? Like you had anxiety before, and then it comes back on you at a later time, and a couple months later, it comes on you again, and you remember that it did pass. Yeah. yeah, like, okay, I, I remember last time I had the same feeling, and oh, yeah, it passed. Okay, so I'm just, I'm having that again. <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah. acknowledge it. I'm just acknowledging that it's there. Mm -hmm. So listen to your mind and your body. It'll show up in your body. Any kind of, like, reminder that you have will show up somewhere. So this is just checking in with yourself and just acknowledging what's going on without catastrophizing. Have I been here before? And then remember then versus now. Um, so a lot of times we, we the threat part of our brain thinks that right now is exactly like how it was. Um, and just calling that out can be really helpful in um, being able to think rationally about it. Sometimes then is now, right? Like sometimes you do go through the same thing again. Um, but this this idea can be really helpful if if like there's a fear response to something that maybe happened before, and you're you're feeling really scared or something, and you want to reassure yourself, like, okay, this is not then, like, it's not, that's not it. Like, that person over there who looks like that other person, that's not that guy. Yeah. For example. Okay. So, this is all about just being observing and describing what's happening, mind and body, and maybe around you, without judging it, without having to, um, go down that path of where it get, things get really scary. It can be very powerful to actually do this. So the body is also a wonderful avenue for healing because trauma is kind of like hangs out in the body. So just some things to think about on your own that you can do. Um, one is that seems obvious, but doing things that you really relax your body or that you enjoy doing. So in other words, if you really don't like going, I don't know, to a two hour spin class, then don't go to two hour spin class, right? Do, do something else. Um, do something that you like, where you can kind of feel your body move in a way that feels better. Deep breathing can actually work. Does anybody know how that works? Mm -hmm. And we're like, I used to try to teach this to like, um, well, sometimes even now when I try to teach it to, to like kids, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I already tried that. That doesn't work. It's like, what well, does, even if you don't want it to, because it turns off like this fight or flight thing in your brain. It's just like flips on the relaxation response. So that can be really helpful. It, it can give your brain a chance for that. Um, that part of your brain that does the rational thinking to kick in um, using some safe or calm mental imagery. Um, so this is something that can really be developed. This is, this is not just go to your happy place. This is actually having like something in your mind that you practice 
and you notice everything about it that feels calm and relaxing and you have it up here so you can go back. Does anybody have anything like that? Where they've done this? Where they develop like a, a, a mental image of something that feels 100% good and they really get into it in their mind and they're like, okay, this is what it smells like. This is what's going on. This is what I see here. Yeah. yeah. So, prayer. Meditation or prayer. This is a little bit different than that. This is like having like just your own place up here. And maybe you find that through meditation or prayer. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Is that like when you use your senses, like you look for five things, you smell yes. you that five, four, three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like mind mindful meditation using your senses, like focusing on what you can see, hear, feel, smell, taste and smell. I was taught uh, in that in that mindset to think of a home, a house. Um, built my house and built a porch and with chairs on it, overlooking wheat fields, and you know, slow that would slowly take me into that meditation. But I can't remember the name of it, but that's how I was supposed to do. Okay, so one way, so one, um, one way to do it is to like build your own house. Well, you see a house, you see a house that you want to live in, or that you okay. Space that you're living here, and, uh -huh. and then you just slowly put it together. Then when you get it together, then you go to it. Yes. And it was time for you to, to be calm. Okay. So like building, like it's almost like a sacred place for yourself. Like it's completely like you. It looks and you furnish it just like how you want. It's like your own special house, and then you go there. Yeah, that's how it's like coming back in mindfulness. So, I mean, I understand mindfulness, but you know, three minutes in, I'm like, oh, I need to do this, or <laughs> that's okay. We are actually going to talk more about mindfulness in a minute. Um, yeah, it's easy to get distracted from that. Muscle relaxation is like, you know, when you lift weights, or if you've ever done anything where you lifted something heavy and your muscle contracts, and then when you put the weight down, it gets relaxed. That's what that means. So, it's actually tensing yourself up like different parts of your body on purpose and letting them go. So you know, the brain learns the difference between tense and relaxed, and then it might be able to do that for you when you need it. Sleep and nutrition, everyone is always talking about sleep and nutrition, right? But it's real. Um, being able to deal with your own emotions and trauma reminders and things like that are done best on if you have enough sleep and just fueling your body for what it needs to do. And, but those things can be impacted by trauma too, right? <laughs> like sometimes it's hard to sleep when you're not feeling right. Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of a catch-22. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, we're going to talk about mindfulness and acceptance and connecting with others. We were talking about that a little bit ago, like connecting with others is really important in healing yourself well, because trauma tends to isolate a person and make you feel like, oh, this is like, has anybody ever gone through this? Like how I have. Um, so making those social connections is really important. Having friends, doing things with other people, not just, kind of holding up by yourself um, and self-expression. So these are all other avenues for healing. Self-expression can be things like, it can be the standard stuff like art or journaling and stuff. It can be other things. It can be, I like planting my garden with these kind of flowers, or I'm going to bake this kind of cake for my family or whatever it is that you like to do. So in other words, it's kind of taking your brain to a different place. If your brain is focused on the bad stuff, doing something else gets you out of that place. Like maybe you like to, I don't know, build things or like whatever it is that you want to do. It just takes your brain to like in a different way. Journaling is good because it makes your brain do something else. Instead of thinking, 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 when you start to write, that's actually a different brain thing than thinking. 
So it's not just getting it down on paper, it's actually asking your brain to do something different than think too much. Um, yeah. Um, I lost my son in 2011. And due to a airplane crash, he was piloting. And uh, due to the people who worked on his plane, when they did his annual, the plane went down. Well, after he passed away, um, I went to a group called Compassion and Friends. It's a worldwide organization. And I think that if you're suffering from some kind of trauma, and you go to a group that can help you that make you feel as though you're not the only one. You're not suffering this by yourself. Uh, because I think sometimes when we feel that kind of trauma, you don't like to talk about it with other people. Or other people just tune you out because they don't like to talk to you about it. Sure. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're afraid of you. So, um, and they avoid you. And sometimes I avoided people because I didn't want to talk to other people about it. And so um, I find that Compassionate Friends is a great organization for me. And I think if, if you're suffering from any kind of trauma, if you get into a social group where you can talk about this and, and like counseling kind of thing, that, that helped me a lot. Okay, thank you for that. So we're talking about um, organized support groups. Uh, like Compassionate Friends was very helpful to you during an intense grieving um, period for you and any social connections. So can be really helpful to be able to share that with others and feel supported. Okay. Mindfulness, this is also another buzzword along with the word trigger, I think. Um, so mindful, so I kind of like these little cartoons, not thinking of you. Are you not thinking what I'm not thinking? <laughs> Find your center to the donut. And the Zen crossword puzzle has nothing across and nothing down. So, so we think about mindfulness as like this state of being where you're actually just only where you are at that moment which is very different from the human experience because we're all programmed to be thinking ahead or to be thinking behind. Uh, you know, always ready for the next thing, learn from experience, that kind of stuff. But sometimes it can be really nice to not do either of those things. And it helps calm your body down very much to do that. So mindfulness does help with the then and the now because it brings you into the now. And it helps you live just side by side with the experiences that you have. Because if you think about things that have been difficult in a person's life, it's not like you're going to forget about them. It's not like they're not important. They're a part of like, if you think about your life as like a quilt, they're like squares in the quilt somewhere. They're there. They're always going to be there. So it's being able to live with those um, in a way that feels not as threatening, not as upsetting. Mindfulness can help with this. So mindfulness calms your body when you're stuck in fight or flight. Helps bring that stress um, response down in the body where you can think more clearly and manage your emotions in a way that um, feels better. Sometimes I like to think about rational thoughts are just helpful thoughts, helpful thoughts and accurate thoughts, because a lot of times we think things that are not true and they're not helpful. So like, um, no one's going to love me is probably not accurate and it's not helpful, things like that. So mindfulness is staying and returning to the present moment. So, um, Earlier, um, someone made a comment like, okay, try this. And then all of a sudden my brain goes, whoop. And I'm thinking of what I got to do, which is fine. That's what brains do. It's not like that's a bad thing. You just go back. You just return back to staying in the mindful state that you're in. And it also involves observing and describing without judgment, just like how we were talking about before. Like, 
I um, was going to just observe the room and describe it without judging it. I can say there is there are two sparkly chandeliers and there's some tile in the ceiling and then there's this wallpaper that sort of looks like a mural of a path and there's a bar over there. Like, okay, so that, did I like describe like, did I say anything bad or good about the room? Just the facts. Yeah, okay. Um, this all helps with acceptance because you're just, you're just noticing things as they are. Um, how do you guys practice this in your life? It doesn't have to be just sitting there. It doesn't have to be, it can be meditating. It can be prayer. It can be lots of things. Um, but anyone like to share how they just kind of stay in the moment and um, enjoy that without their brains going too far ahead or too far back? I do a lot of hiking. Lot hiking. Of hiking and, and observing what's around me and then I get pictures. So I'm very focused on what what's my I'm listening, I'm looking, I'm touching, you know. So that helps. I guess the other word is grounding. So grounding techniques too mm -hmm. to ground yourself when you're in the environment. Okay. Okay, so hiking and really looking at really looking at nature. And um it's not really and grounding. I shouldn't say that I don't go we're gonna call it hiking. I don't go very far. <laughs> But I spend a lot of hours doing. We can that. call it hiking. Yoga helps. Yoga. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yoga helps. Yoga can be wonderful. I can Pilates. Pilates. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's hard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. And you really have to there's like a focus there on just what you're doing. So uh, Pilates, um, for her, she really has to focus on it to make it good and or like what seems like a good workout. We're not going to actually just judge that. That wasn't, I shouldn't have judged that. So you like to focus on your Pilates. And you can actually do that without saying if it's a good workout or a bad workout. <laughs> or just breathing. Hi. Seems like the buzz yoga is somatic yoga, somatic exercises to release wherever you're holding the tension or trauma. Is that a thing? I, I haven't done that thing, but I'm sure it is a thing. There's things happening all the time, which actually, um, we're if we have time at the end, we might do not yoga, but something a little similar. Okay. Actually, for we usually end at seven thirty, so we're getting very close. Okay. So, I wanna... so we may not get to do that, but we're getting close. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> okay. So mindfulness is not like some people think. Like this isn't really what. Like I'm just distracting myself. No, you're not. You're actually just you're you're zoning in. You're not zoning out. It's not really distraction. It actually helps your brain, your brain uh, heal because your brain is plastic. It will change. It kind of reduces that fear in your brain, and that can stick. Yeah, there's a lot of helpful benefits to it. Um, it helps with the amygdala, the fear response. It helps um, you connect with others. It helps you not just react. There's all kinds of benefits to practicing mindfulness, and there's lots of ways to do it. You can meditate, you can pray, you can go for a run, you can do yoga, you can do Pilates, you can build a bench, you can, I don't know, you can read a book, you can do whatever you, whatever, like, keeps you in the present. Okay, so when to seek professional help. So we talked a little bit about this with the kids. Um, so if a person feels really bothered by really intrusive memories, like, it's just cropping up, it's like, having an intruder come into the house. 
kind of like you can't stop it from happening. Um, feeling on edge or anxious all the time, having trouble doing daily things like sleeping, being overwhelmed with like um, negative self beliefs, like guilt, shame, feeling like isolated or maybe noticing that a person is isolated, um, the avoidance things like alcohol and drug use or um, things like that. And um, suicidal thoughts, those are all really good reasons to seek professional help. Some good trauma-focused interventions that you might find out there. Uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is uh, a specific therapy for kids, which is really great. Um, it helps kids have different positive beliefs of them about themselves uh, with the, the trauma that happened. Um, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. Mm -hmm. um, um, also really very helpful, can be very effective pretty quickly. Um, there's other, um, other things, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, developmental and relational trauma therapy, which works on more like early childhood stuff. Yeah, like attachment issues and things. Yeah, so okay, so I made it. So I have just some websites and books and things like that. Um, okay, what are the, um, any questions or more comments? On the books, um, the last one on the list that says childhood disruption, what is that book about? Is it reframing your childhood? What is that about? Relax. Right. Childhood disrupted. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's kind of like like those things that um, like what happened, like the development, all the different like domains that get it impacted by like growing up mm -hmm. and how that impacts people. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the ones are, are kids' books too. Okay. You had kind of mentioned it about the exposing yourself to the event. So exposure therapy. I've gone through that and it did not help. Is that because you, you were kind of intimating? Okay. So exposure therapy, which is slowly um, exposing yourself to something that's um, stressful, that's stressful yeah. um, can be a, it can be a treatment. Yeah. And that's it. that aspect is incorporated into other treatments yeah. with like telling your story and things like that. But I think what can be um, very helpful if that is, was not useful for you is something that really focuses in on how you see yourself with like the specific trauma that you went through and addressing those themes of responsibility, control, and safety. So it might have to do more with like actually challenging um, those negative um, self-beliefs and the emotions that go with them. The emotions that yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. You guys are a wonderful audience. Another question. <laughs> My husband grew up in a very dysfunctional family and he has sensory processing disorder. It's not the condition. I think it's due to all the trauma that he's had, it, does that happen to sensory processing, the loud sound, the people eating, chewing gum? I can't eat, I can't use a real spoon. Yeah, I, I don't, that's like a whole other level, isn't okay. it? Like, so that's totally separate. Means, it means a phone, yeah. Like when yes. you don't like it when somebody's yes. chewing or something. Yes. Um, yes, it's but it very well could have developed from, from his childhood experience. Yes, it did. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank, you. thank you. So thank you so much, everyone. It was really wonderful. And that's it. Great. I love the